Can I just start by asking you, overall, what are your impressions of the settlement scheme as it stands at the moment? Who would like to start? Mr. Deasy? Um, I've had the opportunity to, um, you know, be part of it for children who are looked after. Um, at the moment, we have encountered a lot of difficulties um, in terms of making the application, but also um, the criteria for making the application for our looked after children. For example? Um, the ID document that is required to, to make the application. Um, a lot of our young people have got no IDs at all. And uh, for those who have, um, it is not cheap. And is there anything that you would want the government to do or the Home Office to do that could deal with that? Um, when I met with um, the group of um, you know, the Home Office um, staff who were involved in it uh, initially, um, I did indicate that perhaps for looked after children there should be a different criteria. Mr. Gray? Thank you. Uh, like Rights of Women, Quorum Children's Legal Centre has been involved in advocating for vulnerable people throughout this, this sort of development of the scheme, so since April 2018. And although there have been sort of areas in which the Home Office has been more receptive, it still is fundamentally a scheme which is designed with uh, the lives of someone who is working in the UK in mind, which means that for children the scheme um, has been adapted but isn't particularly intuitive. For separated children, for care leavers, for non-EU stepchildren of EU nationals, for children with any kind of vulnerability, um, things very quickly spiral into being immensely complex using the scheme. So I think the overall messaging about the scheme being straightforward and easy to use holds true for large groups of EU nationals, but for the particular demographic that I advocate for, it, it doesn't hold. Could you give us an example of the kind of problem that might arise? So for a, a child, when they're making an application under the scheme, the scheme will try to direct uh, the applicant to either make an application sponsored by an EU national or make an application in their own right. It's, it's good that children are able to make an application in their own right, and it wasn't always a given that that option would be there. But the list of evidence documents that was presented in the Statement of Intent on the 21st of June 2018 are all documents that are only an adult would hold, like a tenancy agreement, like bills, pay slips. Um, for children, documents might include school records, medical records, for separated children maybe records um, demonstrating that they are looked after, but uh, that documentation isn't necessarily easy to find and if the onus is on the child in any way to produce that documentation, um, there is a huge discrepancy in, in what they're able to provide to the Home Office. That might lead to children being uh, granted pre-settled rather than settled status. It might lead to them not understanding their nationality law rights, which, especially for looked after children, need to be advised on in tandem with um, advice on the settlement scheme. Um, and it could, in cases where there's any kind of criminal activity that a child has been involved in or victim of, lead to refusals or complications under the scheme. Ms. Masri? Um, so our biggest concern about this scheme is that it's one which puts the burden on EU citizens and their family members to apply. So this is not a scheme that is conferring status on eligible individuals. This is a scheme that requires an individual to take an active step and apply in order to secure their future status in the UK. And what we need to remember is that um, this active step needs to be taken, failing which people will become unlawfully present. Um, in the UK at some point in the future. And of course all the consequences of being lawfully present will flow from that. So they will lose the right to work if they don't secure status, they will lose entitlement to housing, they will lose access to benefits, lose entitlement to health care. And so the full force of the hostile environment will fall down upon people who fail to secure status under this scheme but by the deadline. So broadly we're concerned about sort of four categories people who will have difficulty proving their eligibility under the scheme, um, people who can't meet the eligibility criteria of the scheme because of the way the rules have been drafted, 
people who um, could meet the eligibility criteria but simply can't access the scheme because of support needs that they might have and cannot overcome. And then people who simply won't know about the need to apply or will not apply in time. Um, so looking at those sort of in turn, we've got people who will have difficulty proving that they meet the eligibility criteria. That might be because they lack, as Marianne said, identity documents and nationality, not only to prove their own identity and nationality in the UK, but if they're a family member, to prove the identity and nationality of their family member. So for example, if you're an EU citizen and you're a woman in an abusive relationship and your identity documents are being controlled by another person, you, you cannot overcome the, the first step in the application process, which is to provide your valid identity document or passport. If you're a non-EU national and you're separated from an abusive partner um, and you're eligible under the scheme, you are required to provide that abusive ex-partner's identity and nationality as part of the application process as well. And so that can be a barrier that some women will find difficult too. Uh, in addition to identity and nationality, there are all sorts of problems that will flow from the uh, residence requirement. So individuals are required to demonstrate five years of continuous residence in the UK. Now for many that will be a hurdle that they will be able to overcome, particularly with the benefit of the government's automated data checks that they've implemented through this scheme. But for some people, and many within the, the vulnerable cohort that we represent, they will have real difficulty proving their residence in the UK. Perhaps there will be time to talk about our experiences of our clients you going through Private Beta 2, where those automated data checks just didn't help them to prove the continuous residence, and they had to provide their own evidence. Now, we were able to support some people to obtain all the evidence they needed, but others will have gaps, uh, and the issue is how are those gaps going to be treated? 